Good morning, everyone. My name is Woody Kingman, and I am touch the boat. <laughs> In the meantime, I just want to introduce you all to uh, and welcome you all to Breakfast at Blake. It is my honor to represent the Blake Alumni Board, which sponsors these events. We had a terrific breakfast here a month ago over homecoming weekend. We uh, hosted the recipients of the Outstanding Alumni Award, the brothers Dave and Rob Goldberg. We welcome Martha Berry Milberry, who won the Jenny Stevens Aiken Spirit Award, and the Alumni Athlete award went to John Sturgis Classic 1994. And next month I can hope I hope that you can join us when we will hear from Poppy Harlow, class of 2001, who is a CNN correspondent and news anchor. So it should be interesting. Keep your eyes open for announcements about the dates and times. Well today we have the privilege of hearing from Eugene Yates, class of 1953. Gene has spent the majority of his career serving our country. He has been an officer in the U.S. Navy, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Agency, including a position of the Executive Director of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board in the White House for both Presidents Bush and Clinton. A few days ago, I spoke with Gene, now retired, and asked him how he and his wife, Nancy, after 50 years of living in various posts around the world and in Washington, D.C., ended up in the quaint picturesque little town of Orford, New Hampshire, up on the Connecticut River above Dartmouth College. Well, for most of us here, it'll come as no surprise that Gene said it all came back to a relationship and a friendship with Dave and Blake. During his freshman year at Harvard, after graduating from Blake, Gene's old classmate, Paul Schmidt, introduced Gene to his new Dartmouth classmate and new friend, Carl Schmidt, same name, no relation. The three friends spent their college years paddling around together, and after graduation, Carl introduced Gene to his girlfriend Rita's roommate Nancy. Well, sure enough, the two couples were soon married, and throughout the ensuing years, Gene and Carl and their Blake friend Paul remained close friends. Then, 14 years ago, Carl and Rita called and informed Gene and Nancy that the house next door to their home in Orford, New Hampshire, was for sale. And they were such good friends that Gene and Nancy bought it sight unseen. Now I realize that you came here today to hear about spies and spooks and surveillance and international intrigue. You wonder why I tell such a domestic tale. Well, as we all know, this world is a pretty chaotic place. And more and more it seems like it's out of control. And yet, to many of us late and Northrop grads, like Gene and Paul and their friend Carl, Friendships were born here that are so strong, so deep, that they bring meaning to our lives and offer a purpose to our endeavors. The calm and warmth that those friendships bring, the calm and warmth that those friendships bring to our souls, endure in part due to the peace and security that people like Gene Gates have dedicated their lives to create and maintain for the rest of us. So, back to Spooks and Spies. Here today to talk about the snow the Revelation with comments from a former NSA officer who is a great American and plays some of genius. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was nice. That was I'm afraid to touch this thing. <laughs> is it? it is it all set? Yeah. Uh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here today, and uh, uh, I couldn't help but thinking that the last time I stood behind this podium was a little over 61 years ago <laughs> uh, when I and my 28 other Blake classmates graduated from Blake and had our commencement ceremony in this room. Uh, and here it is, 61 years later, and I'm still, uh, still going and <laughs> standing behind this podium once again. I wanted to acknowledge just a couple of people. Just because I think it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I wanted to acknowledge just a couple of people this morning uh, because they're, they're very special to me. Uh, and I wondered if they would mind raising their hands. Uh, John and Laura Crosby. Uh, John is, is largely uh, responsible for my being here today and is one of my oldest friends with whom I had the uh, pleasure of taking a European trip in 1955 that we continue to talk about today. We even talked about it a little bit at the uh, uh, dinner at the uh, Bachelor Farmers last night. Uh, and Laura uh, is a special friend who drove me out here this morning and I couldn't help remember uh, those times when I actually dated Laura uh, <laughs> when we were very, very young. And uh, her father, I think, had a little distrust uh, of this guy who was taking his daughter out because uh, the night that I arrived with my new driver's license to take Laura to the movies at the YZ Theater, Sewell Andrews insisted that the maid go along as chaperone. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to tell that story, Laura, but I, but I, but I couldn't help it. Uh, I wanted uh, my classmates, Dave Caldwell uh, and uh, uh, Don Nightingale, to raise their hands, and my old friend John Nash, who was an usher in my wedding in 1961 to the Nancy that you heard about a few minutes ago. Uh, I also wanted my godson, who I have not seen this morning, but maybe he's here, Slater Crosby, to raise his hand. He's in the back of the room. And hi, Slater. <laughs> also, I wanted to mention to you that, that uh, this speech, for some reason or another, has uh, garnered a lot of attention from people who can't be here today but whom many of you know. And uh, they're just very rapidly. Phil Pillsbury in Washington sends his regards to you. Phil Larson in Chicago. Diane Robinson, who is visiting in Florida. Uh, Cynthia Clifford Mason, who lives in Rhode Island. And uh, Cindy Maughan Powell, who actually read a draft of my speech on Nantucket in September and helped me with a few points. Uh, sends her regards as well. Uh, I'm delighted to have been invited today to describe my career at NSA and to provide you with my views on what I'll call the Snowden situation. Uh, that is to say the fallout from the series of revelations concerning NSA by Edward Snowden, a former NSA contract employee which first appeared in the press in June of 2013. Uh, with your indulgence, I would also like to dedicate my presentation today to the memory of my Blake classmate, Paul Schmidt, uh, who was my old friend, again, you heard a little about him this morning, who died at his home in California in August. Uh, this grand room, the Bovey Chapel, has special meaning for me and brings back a lot of memories, most positive, but uh, some less so. I'm reminded that my mother was a friend of, of Ruth Bovey Stevens, whom I believe endowed this space in memory of her father, Charles Bovey, one of Blake's founders. I attended a daily chapel service here uh, for uh, six years, and uh, when I was in the seventh or eighth grade and was told that I had to stand on the stage and uh, recite uh, a poem or, or give a little speech, I was terrified. And I chose uh, Rudyard Kipling's marvelous poem, If, and made it through in one piece, despite my internal panic. Uh, and I can remember portions of that poem to this day though I won't subject you to them. Uh, on a not so positive note, I also remember the Saturday evening in perhaps my junior year at Blake when a group of friends and our dates somehow gained access to the school 
and held a small party in this chapel space <laughs> with, as I recall now, Tom Venom, class of 1952, playing jazz tunes on the organ. I don't believe I've ever mentioned that event in public before, <laughs> and I hope that the Blake administration, including the head of school whom I just met, uh, will at this late stage forgive us for that youth youthful indiscretion. Uh, I began Blake in the fourth grade in 1944, and what a grand experience that was over the next nine years. Uh, the teachers were superb, and two especially stand out in my mind. Noah Foss, who taught me four out of the five years that I studied Latin at Blake, and Jack Eady, who awakened my lifelong interest in government and foreign affairs. Both of these gentlemen contributed in indirect but important ways to my career in the government and at the National Security Agency. The class of 1953 had 29 members. We are shrinking now, I've noted. And I think we might have set some sort of record for college acceptances. Uh, nine of us went to Harvard, and the majority of the others went to their first choice colleges, Yale, Princeton, Amherst, Dartmouth, Stanford, and the like. When I was about to graduate from college in 1957, all of us were subject to the draft, and we were all thinking hard about the least painful way to satisfy our military obligation. In my case, I, joined, uh, I chose the US Navy and went about finding out how to go to officer's candidate school. However, when I went to take my physical at the Boston Navy Yard, I was shocked to learn that I was colorblind and therefore unable to be admitted to OCS under the rules they had at that time. I was later contemplating a dreaded two years uh, as an army private when the Navy changed its mind and said I could go to OCS after all and that I would be assigned to a part of the Navy that was so secret that no one could tell me what they did. I accepted their offer and that started me on the path to NSA. My association with the National Security Agency lasted over 30 years. I'm proud to have been an NSA employee and I believe that the agency has made enormous contributions to the security of our country since its creation in 1952 and going back to its earlier roots in World War II. When I arrived at NSA uh, at Fort, in Fort Meade, Maryland in 1959, there was a saying that the initials NSA stood for no such agency. <laughs> Though it was larger in terms of personnel and budget uh, than the CIA, it was virtually unknown to the public then and made every effort to keep its highly classified and sensitive activities under wraps. As employees, we were told to tell anyone who asked that we worked for the Department of Defense, and I reflexively find myself doing that to this day. Since I began my NSA career as a young naval officer, I've never spoken in public about my work there until now. Uh, what I intend to do today is to tell you how I became involved with NSA, describe some of my experiences there, and conclude with some comments about Edward Snowden. Uh, shortly after I began my first NSA tour in 1959, we were all shocked when two young NSA mathematicians who worked in the highly secret office at NSA charged with analyzing and breaking Soviet codes and ciphers, defected to the Soviet Union. Their last names were Martin and Mitchell, and at the time, those of us working at NSA found it difficult to imagine a more devastating blow to NSA's mission and to the country's national security interests. Today, I believe that the damage to NSA interests caused by Edward Snowden far exceeds that caused over 50 years ago by Martin and Mitchell, 
and that is part of what I want to discuss with you this morning. I'll begin by stating that I, and I think all Americans, are proud and thankful for the rights provide us, uh, provided to us by the Constitution, but at the same time, we are mindful of the need to protect ourselves against adversaries that threaten our well-being. The Snowden revelations have, among other things, caused a situation where we need to examine these sometimes competing issues and create a balance that may not exist at the present time. This is a difficult task, but I'm confident we'll be able to complete it in a way that addresses the concerns of those on both sides of the debate. I will attempt this morning to at least shed some new light on some of the key issues involved. I should also say that I do not believe the public has been well served by many of the press accounts dealing with the Snowden revelations. In the case of the Guardian newspaper, I think the problem may be that the authors of articles based on the revelations seem to be motivated more by political objectives than by a desire to report the facts, and that it is therefore good if NSA is made to look like a culprit. On the other hand, reports in the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal often seem to reflect the fact that the authors have trouble interpreting the rather complicated and difficult to understand PowerPoint presentations that Snowden seems to have favored in his releases. In any event, it appears to me that a large number of press reports either charge or imply that NSA spends much of its time collecting the content of phone calls of US citizens, and that is simply not correct. I want to turn now to NSA's mission, how I came to work there, and some of the things I did during my 30-year career. Uh, President Harry Truman created NSA in a top secret memorandum dated November 4, 1952, entitled Communications Intelligence Activities. Uh, that day also happened to be my 17th birthday, and I was then a senior at Blake as NSA was being created. The Truman Memo uh, established NSA as an element of the Department of Defense to unify under a single military director the squabbling, competing, and uncoordinated activities of the three service intelligence elements, the Army Security Agency, the Air Force Security Service, and the Naval Security Group. Although NSA was established uh, in the DOD, it was created as a national foreign intelligence agency to, and I'm quoting here from the Truman Memorandum, to satisfy the legitimate foreign intelligence requirements of all executive departments and agencies of the US government. NSA was given a very specific foreign intelligence mission, and I'm quoting again, to provide an effective unified organization and control of the communications intelligence activities of the US con conducted against foreign governments to provide for integrated operations, policies, and procedures pertaining thereto, end of quote. NSA does not decide what foreign intelligence agency uh, information it will try to uh, collect a national process managed by the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, on behalf of the President and the National Security Council, determines what the collection objectives and priorities are. It's NSA's mission to satisfy these requirements through the acquisition of foreign communications used by foreign countries, powers, intelligence organizations, armies, and especially since 9-11, terrorist organizations and individuals. I want to stress here that despite what some in the media might like their readers to believe, NSA's mission is foreign intelligence, not domestic. NSA has neither the authority nor the responsibility 
to intercept domestic communications exclusively between US citizens and persons. In fact, it is strictly illegal for it to do so. Neither NSA nor any other element of the Intelligence Committee, with one important exception, and that is the FBI, may undertake any intelligence collection for the purpose of acquiring information concerning the domestic activities of US persons. Having described how NSA was created and its mission, I want to move on now to how I first became exposed to NSA operations. After completing four months of Navy OCS in Newport and two months of communications school there, I received orders to proceed to my first duty station, the Naval Communications Station on the Aleutian Island of Adak, Alaska. In the Bering Sea, a thousand miles west of Kodiak, Alaska, Adak is remembered by the 6,000 US troops stationed there during World War II as cold, foggy, windy, lots of mud, Quonset huts to live in, but no women and no trees. It, it hadn't changed much when I arrived in September of 1958, except that we were able to move into a BOQ constructed of poured concrete rather than the deteriorating Quonset huts that were still scattered across the island. And there were school teachers whom we could date if we were lucky. ADAC measures about 22 by 40 miles and is credited with being the 25th largest island in the US, more than twice as big as Nantucket, which I have been visiting for over 40 years. But I can assure you that it is certainly not as charming uh, as Nantucket is. During the Cold War, the entire island was controlled by the US Navy and was used as a base of operations for performing surveillance activities against the Soviet Union. Naval reconnaissance aircraft flew missions against the Soviets from ADAC's airfield. And as I will describe in more detail, the Naval Communications Station monitored and collected various Soviet communications targets at the height of the Cold War, NSA had about 30 such intercept stations uh, located around the world. When I arrived at the communication stay, as we call the communication station, I found a compound surrounded by barbed wire, guarded by armed Marines, and with lots of locked doors that were off limits to anyone without the proper security clearance. That turned out to include me, since my security clearance had not yet been drafted, uh, granted. I was therefore assigned to be the base special services officer with responsibilities for running the bowling alley and, and the base commissary. Not exactly why, uh, the, my idea of why I had joined the Navy. After about a month, all that changed when my special top secret clearance came through and I was allowed to pass through the locked doors into what was the completely different and fascinating world of collecting, analyzing, and reporting communications intelligence. On my first visit to the operational space in which these functions were performed, I still vividly remember finding <coughs> a dimly lit room filled with Navy enlisted men wearing earphones and sitting at individual positions filled with electronic gear that allowed them to inter intercept and process the targets to which they were assigned, which included the Soviet Navy, uh, the Soviet Merchant Shipping Program, and the Soviet Missile and Space Program. I could hear the sound of Morse code being sent by Soviet operators. I was able to give up my special services duty in the bowling alley and became for the next year the assistant officer in charge of the ADAC signals collection operation. And I became hooked by the novelty of the tasks being performed and the importance of that mission to US national security. 
It was the beginning of what became my 30-year career at NSA. When my year-long tour of duty on ADAC was completed in September of 1959, I was transferred to NSA headquarters in its new building. Remember that NSA was created only a few years before in 1952 and was therefore only seven years old at the time. This is located at Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, uh, on the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, about halfway between the two cities. And just to mention another coincidence involving my friend John Crosby, John and I arrived at Fort Meade on just about the same day in 1959. I was on my way to work at NSA, and John was in the Army intelligence uh, part working uh, at Fort Meade. So he and Laura uh, moved into an apartment in Laurel, and I renewed my friendship with them. Uh, unless a person had special engineering or linguistic backgrounds, most junior officers ordered to NSA were assigned to an analytic organization covering a specific area, such as the Soviet Army, Navy, or Air Force. I was lucky and got assigned as a watch officer in something called the Production Intelligence Watch Office. The bad news was that we often found ourselves having to go to work at 4 p.m. in the afternoon or perhaps at midnight. The good news is that our job was to read all of the intelligence traffic coming into or leaving NSA, compile interesting information into a daily report distributed throughout the agency, and taking turns, brief the NSA director and his senior staff each weekday morning. What that really meant is that I and my seven junior officer colleagues received a top-down education in the broad areas which NSA covered and involved us directly in helping to manage crisis events as they occurred. For example, I was the officer on duty the night in May of 1960 when our U-2 reconnaissance aircraft was shot down over the Soviet Union, creating an international incident of gigantic proportions and great embarrassment for President Eisenhower and our country. And as such, I was one of the very few Americans who knew what was going on as the event was actually occurring. I participated that night in the preparation of the message that informed the CIA, who were the mission sponsors, along with the Defense and State Departments and the White House, as to what had occurred. This was a heady and very educational experience for a young naval officer. I learned so much about the workings of NSA and its tremendous contributions to the security of the country that as my uh, Navy tour was drawing to a close in 1961, I barely hesitated when my supervisor asked if I would convert to civilian status with NSA, which I did in August of 1961. I was also getting married in September of 61 to my wife Nancy, whom you've heard about, and I decided that rather return to Minneapolis and my job at Cargill, which I had left to join the Navy, we would spend a year more in Washington and then return to Minnesota. Once that year was up, however, I was really hooked by the work at NSA, and I continued uh, on with them for 27 more years. I might say that I'm extremely proud of the work I did there and have never regretted my decision to stay on. Uh, turning now to the subject of, of Edward Snowden, I will be neither... How, how appropriate. <laughs> I'm going to start again. I don't know why all of a sudden I did that. I don't, I don't think I did anything. No, you didn't. We'll get you back.
Okay? We can start over again. Turning now to the subject of Edward Snowden, I'm listening. <laughs> I will be neither surprised nor offended if some of you find yourselves in disagreement with some of my thoughts on this subject. Uh, I'll share with you this, some actions that I and uh, some former NSA colleagues have taken over the past year and describe the oversight environment in which NSA operates. I'll also comment on some of the uh, revelations and how they were pro portrayed in the press and finally provide my personal assessment of what all this means for the future of, NSA's, uh, of NSA and our country's <coughs> national security. <clears throat> to begin this discussion, I want to draw on some thoughts from an author named Edward Lucas, who is currently a senior editor of The Economist, who describes himself as a former foreign correspondent with 30 years experience in Russian and East European affairs. In a book entitled The Snowden Operation, Inside the West's Greatest Intelligence Disaster, published in January of this year, Lucas begins as follows. He says, some of my most respected colleagues tell a story that goes like this. Edward Snowden had a well-paid post inside American intelligence as a contractor for the NSA. Disillusioned by the discovery that his employers and their allies engaged in mass collection of details of private communications, he took a cache of secret documents detailing this appalling behavior and shared them with media outlets across the world. The noble crusader was bravely risking his career and freedom in the pursuit of truth and transparency, a sacrifice that has made him a worthy candidate for Man of the Year awards and for canonization as a secular saint. Lucas continues as follows. He says, this book tells a different story. My reading of the facts is that Snowden is what he calls a useful idiot. His theft of documents should be seen not as a, an heroic campaign, but as a reckless act that has jeopardized our safety and played into our enemy's hands. Lucas goes on to say, the damage wrought by Snowden's revelations takes five forms. It weakens America's relations with Europe and other allies. It harms security relationships between those allies, especially in Europe. It corrodes Western public opinion's trust in their country's security and intelligence activities. It undermines the West's standing in the eyes of the rest of the world, and it has paralyzed Western intelligence agencies." End of quote. Whether you agree with either of these uh, opposing views of Snowden as described by Edward Lucas or come down somewhere in the middle, I think that Lucas has provided some useful boundaries for examining the revelations and their implications in more detail. Uh, since 2000, as uh, Woody indicated a little earlier, I've lived in a region of the country called the Upper Connecticut River Valley, which has Hanover and Dartmouth College as its cultural center and includes many uh, smaller towns in both Vermont and New Hampshire, including my town of Orford. Living near me are two old friends and former NSA colleagues. We meet periodically in Hanover for lunch at something called the Canoe Club, and not surprisingly, our principal topic of discussion over the past year has been Edward Snowden. Last November, uh, I and one of those colleagues made a presentation to Snowden, uh, on Snowden, to about 80 mostly retired individuals at a symposium sponsored by Dartmouth's Continuing Education Organization. And I want to share some of our thoughts uh, expressed at that time with you. In my friend's presentation, he described NSA's mission 
and the extensive set of laws and regulations that govern its operations, especially as they relate, as they relate to the protections they provide to the privacy and rights of US citizens in regard to unreasonable searches and seizures as specified in the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. He cited the following four documents and explained their relevance. First, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, called the FISA Act, which was put in place after the uh, Intelligence uh, Committee's inspection of the intelligence community during the early 70s. Secondly, something called Executive Order 12333, which was issued first by President Reagan and then subsequently uh, reissued by, by the presidents. Third, the Patriot Act of 2001 that you've all heard about. And fourth, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 Amendments Act of 2008. Each of these four documents authorized new intelligence tools, some of which have become the focus of the current debate centering on NSA. Time doesn't allow me to discuss each of these documents in any detail, so let me focus on one key issue that is currently being discussed in Washington. <clears throat> the Snowden controversy has introduced a new term into the mainstream of the discussion, and that uh, word is, is the word metadata, which can be described as details about a communication, but not involving the actual content of the communication. For a mobile telephone call, this could be the number dialed and the duration of the call. For an email, metadata could include the size, date, addressee, and details about the sender, such as the internet connection. Section 215 of the Patriot Act amended the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 78 to permit the government to obtain from the Federal Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which was also created in the 78 law, an order directing US communications carriers to provide the government with metadata from calls made between the US and a foreign country and calls, some calls made entirely within the US. NSA is not allowed to obtain the content of the call, the identity of any party to the call, or any cell site locational information relating to the call. The FISA court, all of whose judges are appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, first authorized Section 215 uh, program uh, collection in 2006, and it has been renewed up until 2013, the last year that I have record, renewed 34 times by 14 different judges. All of these judges have found the program to be legal and constitutional. NSA's purpose in collecting and analyzing this metadata is to determine whether known or suspected terrorist operatives have been in contact with other persons who may be engaged in terrorist activities, including persons and activities within the United States. And here, just as an example of those kinds of persons, you might think about the people in San Diego who were planning the attacks uh, in New York and Washington in 2001. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that had the these procedures been in place there that all those dots would have been collect, uh, connected, but I am suggesting that they could have been connected and connected much faster than they were. When NSA's analysis results in a reasonable suspicion that a foreign uh, terrorist element may be operating in the US, it provides a tip off to the FBI who uh, attempts to identify and investigate the subscriber to include possibly the FBI's own application to the FISA court for a warrant to authorize interception of the contents uh, of 
communications to and from this number. NSA, as an entity, does not intercept the content of any domestic phone calls in this Section 215 program. Because of the sensitive nature of this program and its Fourth Amendment implications, there exists an extensive oversight process to ensure that neither the law nor the constitutional rights of US citizens are being violated. Internal to NSA, the process is monitored by the Inspector General, the General Consul, and the relatively new NSA Director of Compliance, supported by a staff of 300 people to monitor the process 24 hours a day, seven days a week. External to NSA, the program is monitored by elements of the Department of Justice, the Director of National Intelligence, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and the two intelligence committees of the Congress. There's lots of oversight going on every day with respect to NSA. I've spent so much time describing this program, the 215 program, because I wanted to try to give you a picture of the kind of thing that NSA is actually doing in the war on terror, as opposed to the many negative and sometimes unbalanced reports in the press on the operational activities and capabilities of NSA that have been based on the voluminous data stolen by Edward Snowden from NSA files. Again, too many of these reports, either in their headlines or in the body of the article, are worded in a manner that creates deep suspicion that NSA is deliberately spying on Americans, and that is simply not the case. I'd like to conclude my presentation this morning with two observations and a thought for the future. First, there is no doubt in my mind that our country is less safe as a result of Snowden's actions. I therefore believe that Edward Snowden should be tried in a US court for the criminal act of releasing highly sensitive intelligence information to the press. Second, I hope that current discussions involving the administration and the Congress over rules that would govern NSA operations are resolved in a timely manner and in a way that considers both protection of civil liberties and the continued maintenance of a robust and capable intelligence collection system to protect our country. Finally, I want to share with you something that NSA's Director of Compliance mentioned in a lecture he gave to Dartmouth students last April in Hanover, which I was privileged to attend. You'll recall that I earlier described his organization of 300 individuals that NSA put in place in 2009 to ensure the agencies, uh, that the agency's analysts were in compliance with all laws and regulations that govern their actions. In, in this gentleman's concluding remarks at Dartmouth, he quoted the recently retired and highly respected NSA deputy director a guy by the name of Chris Inglis, who said that you might want to compare the Snowden revelations as being similar to having an arsonist set fire to your house. The bad news is that your house is destroyed. The good news is that you get to build a new and better one. May it be so for NSA as they move into the future. In other words, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We would be very foolish, in my opinion, to try to wage a successful war against radical Islam with one arm tied behind our back. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome your comments or questions if there's any time left. I think I ran over a little bit, but whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. That was really great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you have a 9 o'clock class, yeah. correct? Okay. No. Or, or I think that you're teaching, so I'll, I'll say we've gone a, a little over. Uh, Gene.
Well, first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm really, uh, as, as a former guy who worked for NSA, I'm really not in a very good position to uh, uh, comment on that. But since you asked the question, uh, I think it's going to be kind of a rocky road uh, going forward. And uh, I, I, I don't know, it's not, not really appropriate for me to comment on Ukraine and so on, but I, I don't see an easy solution to those sorts of problems. Uh, I see a continued tension between the countries uh, having to do with Snowden's uh, presence in, in Russia. And uh, I'd like to see him brought back here and tried, as I indicated before, but uh, I don't know if that'll ever be possible to do. I mentioned the two NSA spies of many, many years ago uh, in my earlier remarks, and I was interested to note, uh, I Googled them because I wanted to see what happened to them. Uh, they both went to Moscow, were traded. They went to Moscow on a Soviet merchant ship out of New York. It took them six weeks to get there. They surfaced in Moscow and uh, to the great embarrassment and annoyance of the US government. And they stayed there. Uh, and one of them got out and went to Mexico and died there in 1987 and was buried in the US. The other died in St. Petersburg in 2002 and is buried in Russia. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to Snowden. <laughs> Sir. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've, I didn't read that book, but I've, I've seen those same uh, charges made in, in various articles. And, and uh, I suppose anything is, is possible. The point that I was trying to make is that that isn't what NSA is doing with metadata. Uh, obviously, if, if, uh, if something is out there and, and anyone can intercept it, uh, which in many cases is the case today. Uh, there's a danger that, uh, that your liaison with your girlfriend might, might become public, but, but that, isn't, that isn't the purpose of NSA's business. NSA is looking for terrorists, and it does everything it can to protect uh, the rights of US citizens. Uh, sometime there might be a crossover between those two things, and they would try to adjudicate that in a, in a proper way. But I, uh, thanks for your comment. Sir. Well, to, uh, I, I can't actually speak for what NSA is doing this very second because I haven't read an NSA report in, uh, in some years. But 
typically NSA would not involve itself in that. What it's doing is providing information to the CIA, to the State Department, to the Defense Department, and to the White House, and it's their job to figure out the tough answers uh, based on all the intelligence they get, whether it's human intelligence from CIA, signals intelligence from NSA, or military intelligence gathered by the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, I, I just, I, I, you all probably know the name Nicholas Burns, who is the former second guy in the State Department, now a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard, who came to Dartmouth, I keep mentioning Dartmouth because I'm so tied up with, in the Dartmouth community. He came to Dartmouth this summer and gave a three hour presentation that addressed the kinds of things you're talking about and uh, he didn't paint a very uh, uh, hopeful uh, picture of what he saw coming down the road in the Middle East, and I can't add much to that. Gene, I, I take it from your remarks that you are basically satisfied with the function of the FISA court, that it, it balances the security interest, if you will, and the privacy interest adequately in terms of both security and privacy. Is that accurate, or are those critics of the FISA court correct? claim that either the privacy or the security interest can't be got quickly enough or efficiently enough? Uh, thank you for that question, no, Lynn. No, no, thank you, <laughs> thank you Lynn. Uh, that's a tough question, and, and I, I don't have a personal opinion on that. I, I think what I hinted at uh, in my remarks, there are lots of things going on in Washington as we speak. Uh, Senator Leahy, uh, the head of the Judiciary Committee, has a bill uh, pending. Uh, the two intelligence committees are looking at these kinds of issues and related issues. And I think that many people, myself included, feel that some of the actions taken after 9-11 as part of the Patriot Act and, and related things uh, went perhaps too far. And so I, as a citizen, am glad that th there is a dialogue going on, and my hope is that we don't t tip too far in the other direction, protecting individual rights at the expense of the capability of dealing with a very complicated, long-range threat like uh, the radical Islamic threat that we face. And uh, as to the court, uh, my, I, my personal knowledge of their activities is, is almost, not, I don't know very much about it. it. It wasn't there for much of the time when I, was, uh, when I was active and had the right clearances and everything else. Uh, I suspect there needs to be some looking at that. But on the other hand, I am very happy that it's there and that, uh, that warrants uh, are able to be granted based on evidence that is provided to these judges, who I have to hope are, are reasonable and logical and, and smart people. Uh, again, I, I'm not uh, in a great position to comment on things like that, but since you ask, uh, I, I, think, I think we would all agree that 9-11 itself was, was kind of unimaginable. I, I think that people did not think as they looked forward into the future that such a terrible thing could ever happen in this country. And therefore, I believe that the possibility that something worse or similar uh, is, is, is it's, it's a very possible thing. And, and it's the kind of thing, however, that it is very unlike, unlikely that we'll be able to discover much in advance. And, and uh, so we have to be prepared. 
Uh, I hope it doesn't happen, but it might. Roger. Well, 9-11, uh, as I understand it, uh, obviously took everybody by surprise, and yet there are a lot of stories about the fact that there was intelligence that came uh, in front of George Bush as president, uh, and that they were talking about uh, the Laden threat and so on. And it's kind of put on the back burner, uh, not addressed or dealt with. So the question in my mind is, is the value Yeah. Well, that that is a marvelous question, and and uh, uh, and it probably uh, is is a fair assessment of some of the things that might have happened at that time, but I think that's the <laughs> that's the way government works. You 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 have. Uh, a flow of data coming in, whether it's intelligence or diplomatic or whatever it is, and, uh, and you're trying to balance that against lots of other things that are going on. And I, uh, I, I, I certainly wouldn't stand here and fault the president uh, at that time or his national security team with, with missing something, because I think, I think what probably happened is that as, as is often the case, the information is, is not clear, or it's not definitive enough to say, this is gonna happen on this day, which is something that would get your attention. It's, it was probably more general in nature, and, uh, and it should have, and, and maybe did, uh, cause them to look more carefully at various things. The problem is uh, with that, and, and this, I guess, was talked about later and, and has been in the press and everything else. Uh, if we'd had some of these tools in place, it is likely or it is possible that it would have been, uh, it would have been possible to identify these cells uh, in the United States and do something about them in advance. Uh, I don't think anyone would say we positively could have done that, but we might have been able to do it. And that's what I, I hope we maintain a capability that allows us to, to do things like that in the future. Gene, I think we have time for one last question. Kay. We should probably give it to the head of school, so. <laughs> well, that, that seems appropriate. That is, thank you, and that's a, a great question. And uh, I, as you know, I'm gonna be meeting with, with two classes later this morning down at the other school. And I was gonna come at it from kind of a different standpoint. I was gonna talk to them about what do they think they wanna do with their lives. And uh, while they're thinking about it, might they not be wise to include in their thinking uh, the government as something to work for? Uh, I loved working for the government. First of all, I loved working for Cargill when I worked for them for eight months before I went into all of this. But then I loved working for the government. And I think students today uh, are too likely to be focused on something other than the government. And I'm gonna to suggest to some of your students that they at least think about government as they move forward into career uh, deciding things. Uh, what I would, in direct response to your question, that what I would say is that 
uh, I think, a strong grounding in history, uh, coupled with a strong grounding in foreign and ancient languages, uh, is an important ingredient for students, whether they go into the government or into banking or whatever. Gene, thank you very, very much. This is great. Thank, thank you. you. It was just so great of you. Well, just thank wonderful. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. So.